last week, we, uh, we talked a lot about uh, our motives, and we, we were challenged to do something that's very difficult, and I, and I knew from that, I said, this is going to be difficult to do, and, and I, I think some of you probably actually tried to do this. I'm sure some of you, you're probably like, I, haven't, I didn't even think about it, but last week, you were challenged to think about what your motives are. To, to challenge yourself, to dis- seek to discover what is, the mo- what is my motive. Why do I think the way I think? Why do I think the thoughts I think? Why do I do the things I do? Why do I act in the ways that I do? Because we, we know, I mean, just, just on, almost just built in, we know that our motives are important. We know that that's a really important thing. And we have this unbelievably, we are so talented at deceiving ourselves as to what our real motives are. And we just, we just, I just, it's like, it's like in no time I can just convince myself that my motives are good. In fact, I go around li- living all life assuming, assuming that I have good motives. And if anybody questions my motives, well, they're just obviously wrong. I have good motives and I just know it. But the truth is, the truth is, much of the time, you and I, we don't even know what our motives are. We don't know what our motives are because we have so deceived ourselves that what we're thinking and what we're doing is right. We have justified it. We have have built our own little reality, and this is the right way. When, When in fact, very possibly, we are doing the exact wrong thing for the wrong reason and don't even realize it. That's what the writer of Proverbs was getting at when he said this, and we looked at this proverb last week. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. You can can so easily think you are doing the right thing for the right reason and be completely deceived yourself. But there is someone who knows your motive. There is someone who knows the truth. There is someone who knows the insecurities, who knows the pride, who knows the selfishness, who knows the self-centeredness. He knows all of that. And it's not hidden. And the weird thing is, is when we have just the least little bit of inkling that our motives may not be pure, our reaction is to distance ourselves from him, from God. It's like, it's like you know, I, I, just, you know, I just kind of hold him at arm's length because I, I don't want him to know what my real motives are when, in fact, I really know he already knows. I mean, so what am I doing? But the fact, I, I don't want to know myself what my motives are. I don't want myself to face up to what my real motives are because, see, if I acknowledge my motive, then it, it's like it becomes real. As long as I can ignore it, as long as I can you know, justify it, as long as I can stay ignorant of it, it's, it's really not real. But as soon as I own up to it, doggone, I've got to do something about it because it's real. And so I just you hold that at a distance. But you know, it's real, whether we acknowledge it or not. So we might as well just acknowledge it and face up to the, the motives that are in our heart. And you know, the, the only way that we can really discover those motives is if we go to the one who knows our motives. And so I challenged you last week to get, get by yourself, to be with God, and to ask yourself and him a few questions. God, what do I want? What is it that I really want? And why do I want it? Then another uh, question that seems very similar but really gets much more to the core of who we are. What do I value? What is this extreme importance at the core of me? What do I care about? What do I value? And the, the truth is, is often what I want is not the same thing as what I value. My surface desires, things that I want in this moment are not they don't go as deep as the, value, as the values that are, that are inside of us. And facing up to those, what do I need to do? What, God, what, what is it that I need to do about where my motives are? Uh, now, if you, if you took this seriously, and, and if you got to spend some time uh, examining yourself and, and, and in prayer, examining your motives, you probably discovered 
that your motives, at least a large part of your motives, are sort of a mixture of self-centered, temporary desires, okay? Now, it's not a condemnation. This is true for all of us. All of us have self-centered, temporary desires, things that just, just I, I want. Um, you may have found that what you want is pleasure in some form, okay? Whether it just be re relaxation, fun, sex, enjoying buying stuff that you, that you want to have, you know, enjoyment of having nice stuff that you want, you know, some kind of, of pleasure, of that temporary pleasure. That, that, those, that's a motivation for, for all of us to some degree. Um, you may have found that what you want is you want to be significant. You want to be you want to be well respected. You want people to like you. You want people to look up to you. You want, you want to have good standing among other people. You care about what other people think about you. That's a, that's a want that you have, a desire. Uh, for you, it may not be so much what other people think about you. You may have just your own expectations on yourself. I want to be successful. I want to measure up to my own standards. I feel like I am successful if I can achieve this and I can do this, and I want to live up to that. I have this sort of self. I want to be significant, at least in my own eyes. That, that powers a lot of what a lot of us do. Um, and here's what different one but that may be very real to you. You may want to escape your life. You may want to leave behind the pain that you have inside, that there is pain inside and that is there and you can't get rid of and you just want to escape it. And you may try to escape it through work, through keeping yourself busy all the time, you may, you may try to escape it through, uh, through drinking, uh, through, through drugs. You might try to escape it through relationships. That, that, did you find yourself running from yourself? And what you want is a relief from whatever it is inside of you that is bringing you pain. Whether I hit upon any of your wants or not, we all have self-centered temporary desires. And these are the things, these desires are the things that are right on the surface. These are, these are things that are right in the forefront of our conscious mind. I want this. I, I want that. And because they are so on the surface, they are very powerful. And our wants are often in conflict with our core values. Because usually what I value, what I really consider to be most important, is often at odds with my wants because what I value has to do with my character and my relationships. What I, what I value has to do with who I am and who I love. But the thing is, is my wants, my surface desires, my surface temporary desires often simply overcome my core values. My values is what I really care about. And my values is what really God cares about. My values get more to the core of what is truly important. So I'm, I'm just going to assume for a moment, okay, that you have done the difficult job of examining your motives, that you have looked at what you want and what you desire, and, and you've, kind of, you've kind of grappled with that, and you've, you've found out uh, some of your temporary, self-centered uh, desires. And now, you feel bad about yourself. <laughs> it's like, thanks, Brian. You know, I thought I was a pretty good person. And then you had me do all this self-examination and look at my desires and what drives me and all that. And now I feel like, you know, my, my motives are all screwed up and my, I'm, just, I'm just a terrible person. You know, thank you. Fine. I'm terrible. There we go. Okay, is that the point? No, no, that's not the point. That's, that's not the point at all. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that there is, a, there is a better way. There is a better way than be driven in your life, driven by your surface temporary desires. Because if you live controlled by your surface temporary desires, what you end up with is nothing. 
Nothing. Somebody thought I was talented. Somebody thought I did a good job. I had pleasure for a moment. That was fun. That was cool. And now, there's nothing. It's a vapor. If you spend your life controlled by your surface temporary desires, that in the end, you've got vapor. It vanishes. There's nothing left. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, you know there's something different than that, that there's something more than that. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I I want you to maybe start to get the inkling that, you know, I think there may be more to life, maybe something much more, so much more richer than what I have, have experienced. There is a different set of motives, okay? There is a different, an alternative set of motives that changes the way we think and the way we behave and what we do. And it's the motivation that we were designed to have. It's the motivation that at our core we long for. We want this motivation. We want to be this kind of person. We want to be motivated in this kind of way. It's sort of at the core of who we are. It makes sense of everything. And we desire it. And when it is experienced fully, when when this new set of motives is in your heart, it, it, it is part of heaven in this earth. That, that the more I am motivated with these motives, the more heaven, the more God invades my life and the more heaven invades my world that I live in. It's a motivation that's found throughout the Bible, but it's stated most clearly by Jesus. And if you've, you've, if you've uh, uh, read the Bible very much or been around church much, you have heard this many times. And It's one of those things that's so basic and solid and yet in some ways so difficult for us to grasp. But here's what was going on. Uh, Jesus was with uh, a group of people and the the religious leaders, you may know, there was a bunch of religious leaders at the time and they were always trying to trap Jesus in what he would say. And a lot of times Jesus would answer their question with a question. He would would get around that question that they were trying to trap him with. He He wouldn't be trapped. But in this case, Jesus just flat out answered it. Trying to, trying to catch him, catch him with, with an answer, and he said, hey, you've hit upon something that's really important. I'm going to flat out answer your question. And their question was this, Jesus, what's the most important commandment in the law? They were talking about the Old Testament law, the law of Moses that the Israelites had followed for hundreds of years, that the Jews now you know, considered their, their law. What is the most important commandment? Jesus said, you know, that's, that's a question I'll answer. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. This is interesting because Jesus didn't reply to their question with a specific commandment, really. I mean, you think, you know, the Ten Commandments were like the top ten, you know, commandments for the Israelites. Jesus didn't, like, pick one. He didn't pick a commandment and say, hey, go and do this. This is the most important. Or, or stop doing this. You know, don't murder. Don't steal. Don't covet. You know, he, he didn't give, us, he didn't give a, a thing to do or a thing not to do. Jesus gave us a motive. He didn't say, go and do this. That's the most important. He said, I'm going to give you the motivation for you to do everything that you do. If this is the motivation for what you do and for why you do what you do, that is going to affect everything else. What should the basic motive for a follower of Jesus be? What should be my motive? And that answer is love for God. To love God with my heart, with my soul, with my mind, with all of me, every part of me, to simply love God. The driving force behind all my thinking and everything that I do is love for God, is to be love for God. And we'll see in a moment, love for people. But that's really part of the same thing, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of address that here in just a moment. I would guess that uh, many of you who have been connected with church in, in some way uh, through, throughout your life, or for a few years at least, have heard this lots of times. 
but it seems so very difficult to hold on to, so difficult to grasp. How do I love God? If that's, if, if, if the most important thing is a motive, is for my motivation to be love for God, how do I do that? I, you know, I don't see God. I don't see, you know, how do I, how do I grasp that? Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus helped us sort of with our picture of God, with our being able to have a relationship with God, because Jesus called God, and he taught us to call God Father. Our Father. And you may have had a really good dad. You may have had a lousy dad. And if you had a lousy dad, the whole father thing may be, be difficult for you to, to really you know, you know, grasp onto. But a lot of you have kids. And, and you love your child. And if you're engaged with your child at all, you have a love for your child that, it, it's a, really, it's a fierce sort of love. And you don't love them like you want to. You, you know you, you lose your patience. You struggle with, I mean, they, they drive you crazy and you have some difficult times with them. But even when you fail as a parent, you want to succeed. You want to love them. You want to love them more. But there's something in you that, because you, you really do, you love that child. And Jesus said, you know, if you love your child as badly as you love, as badly as you love, as poorly as you do it, but you love your child, imagine how your heavenly Father loves you. He loves you. You can turn your back on Him, but He's not turning His back on you. He loves you. And if that would just sink in, I'd just realize how much God loves you. He, he, and he doesn't just say he loves you. He, he, has, he has sacrificially loved you. He has gone through ridiculous amounts of pain and struggle and trial. When he, has, he doesn't have to do that. He's God. But you know, he dreamed you up in his mind. He knit you together. He created you. And he has been with you through everything that you've been going through. And he knows your innermost self. He knows the things that you don't even know about yourself. And he loves you anyway. And he wants you. And he wants you to know him. And he wants you to be able to love him back. He wants you to experience his joy, his peace, his relationship with him. That's that's something he desires for you, deeply desires for you. He loves you. And if you can get a hold of how much he loves you, then you can begin to love him back. And when you love him back, that changes everything. Love for God is the great motive. This, this is the motive that I want to have driving my life. This is the motive that we are created for. But, it, but it's not just a me and God thing. Sometimes we fall into the trap, a sort of a religion trap of, you know, my religion is just a personal thing. It's just a me and God thing. But what we find is that when we have genuine, sincere love for God, that we we discover our value. We discover our self-worth. Not in what other people think about us or any of our own expectations, but, but in Him. We discover our self-worth in Him. And when I don't depend on other people for my self-worth, I am freed up to love them. Because I discover, you know, the God I love, the God who loves me and the God who I love, He values that person. He cares about them. And so I can't help but care about them too. I'm just, I'm just not allowed. I'm not, God's love does not permit me to withhold love from you. Even if you haven't done anything for me, even if you've done things against me, even if you have hurt me, you know what? 
God loves me, and my love for him just doesn't allow me to hate you. My love for him just compels me to love you anyway because God's love for me doesn't depend on my, uh, my goodness. A lot of us maybe grow up in the church or not grow up in the church and have the idea that God will love me if I'm good. God's love for me does not hang on my goodness. He knows the wickedness in me. He knows the bentness, the warpness in me. And he still loves me. God's love for you does not depend on your performance, on how well you do, on how, how many good things you do. Oh, you did this stack of good things, and so now you're, you're kind of in better, better shape with me. Oh, you've been, you know, my performance is not what causes God to love me. He loves me. He's not impressed by my successes. He's not impressed when you succeed. He's not condemning when you fail because that's not why He loves you. He loves you because you're His. He loves you because you belong to Him. And He wants you. He desires you. And He wants you to experience life in Him. And when that happens, when I begin to realize that, I begin to love others. I begin to love other people. Not based on their performance not based on their goodness, not based on what they have done or what they haven't done to me, but because, you know what? They belong to my dad. And so they belong to me too. So now we're, I hope we're, we're beginning to see just a little bit fuller picture of, of the motive that is to drive God's children. I'm to be motivated to do what I do out of love for God and love for people. Now I can begin to see what my motives have been, all my self-centered, temporary desires that so easily drive my life. I can recognize what those are, and then I can see what God really created me to be motivated by, where life is at, where, where true life is at, where, where the motive uh, drives my life in a way that, that, that helps me to be who I was created to be. Now perhaps I can stop stumbling in the dark, assuming that my motives are good. This is our big mistake, okay? Go through life, stumble through life, assuming that my motives are good, bumping into people along the way, blaming them for the, for the bumps, blaming them for blaming my situation for all the things that, that are going on, Bla- because I simply am in denial about what my own motives are. When we recognize, when I ask the question, what is my motive? It kind of clears up. And I can see what my motives are, but I, but I don't stop there. You know, sometimes we, we church people, we'll, we'll get to a point, hey, man, I, and let me just lay it out on the table. I'm bad at this, I'm bad at this, I'm bad at this. You know, I'm, this, these, are, these are bad motives that I have. I know it's not the way it should be. And we just leave it there, you know? You know, I'm, I'm, and, you know all this bad stuff about me. And uh, just the simple fact of acknowledging it somehow makes it better. No, but when it doesn't, simply acknowledging it, the fact, brings it into the light. But then, what do I do with that? What do I do with these motives that have been driving me that have actually been leading me to somewhere I don't want to go? What I do now is to pursue God, is to, is to pursue a love for God as I seek to have my basic core motivation to be love for God. So I'm, I'm going to challenge us to ask a question, okay? Um, we, might, we might tape this question. I think I'm going to put this question on the steering wheel of my car simply because of the way it's, way it's worded, okay? Um, put it on your lock screen in your phone. Just a, just a question for you to ask daily, ask for you to reflect on daily. And here's the question. Oh, I skipped a whole big verse there. Oh, well, that's okay. We talked about it, even though I didn't refer to the verses. What is driving me? What is driving me? Which is simply another way of asking, what is my motive? What what is causing me to think the thoughts I'm thinking? What's causing me to do the things I'm doing? We might ask the question this way. What am I working for? 
maybe in my career, maybe in my job, if you, if you have a job, an earning money kind of job, what, what am I doing my job for? What am I working for? Why, why am I doing this? What's driving me? Is it simply, ah, got to have a job to make money because I got to support my family and I want some nice stuff and I want to have a certain standard of living? And, you know, this, this, it, is it just really self-centered, temporary desires? Or do I do my job? Do I do what I do because I love God? And because I love God, I love people. And I want to bless God and bless people with the work of my hands, with what he puts me to doing. I am driven by love for him. What, what's driving me in my job? What's driving me? If you're a stay-at-home mom, what's, what's driving me in raising my kids? Do I, do I want my kids... And I'm like, my kids aren't here this morning. They're in Nashville uh, with, with Aaron, with their, their, their family. But uh, it's so tempting. Am I raising my kids so that I can be proud of them so that other people might look at my kids and say, ooh, what great kids, and so that reflects well on me, and so I want my kids to do well in school, I want them to do well in sports, I want them to do, you know, with this, because <clears throat> it's really sort of about me. Is that what's driving me? Or is my, is my, am I being driven by a love for God and a love for for them that comes out of that. When I'm, when I'm making a decision, when I'm trying to make an important choice in my life, or even just, even just smaller decisions, it's really, really good to ask. When I start, okay, well, do I do this or do this? What's driving me? Well, what's what's motivating? What's, what is in me that's making me want to choose this over this? What is it that I am wanting? What is driving me? Is it simply... My self-centered, temporary desires, it's going to go up in smoke? Or am I being motivated out of love for God and a love for people? When I'm in a conflict, uh, when I'm mad, somebody, somebody is being disrespectful to me, somebody is not doing their job, somebody is, is dis, you know, treating me poorly, uh, somebody's in my way, somebody's making me mad. And I'm stewing over it. And I'm having this argument with them in my head, or maybe in actual reality. And I'm having this argument. And it's so important to, to just stop. Ask God, God, what's driving me? What's, what's the real reason that I'm angry? What's behind it? Is it because I love God fiercely? And so I love people, and that's why I'm so mad. Now, there is such a thing as anger that is motivated by love for God and love for people. All you have to do is read the Gospels and see Jesus, see that happened to Jesus. You know, he did some things like drive people out of the temple who were the, the merchants sell, selling, the, selling the animals and all that kind of stuff and drive them out. And why did he do it? Because he loved God and he loved people. And what they were doing was totally rebellion against love for God and love for people. And it was an expression of his love for God. He, he had some very <clears throat> angry words to say to a lot of religious leaders who were so much more concerned about their rules and their appearance than they were about people and about people being taken care of and about people finding God. And it made him angry. It was, it was a good kind of anger. It, that exists. But if you're like me, most of my anger is about me. It's about somebody getting in my way. It's about somebody not treating me the way I feel like they should be treated or somebody having a different opinion than me or somebody having different values than me that just rub me the wrong way. And that, that just gets to me. But you know, when my motive, when I stop and I say, you know what? My motivation is to be a love for God, a love for people. That won't allow me to continue to be angry at someone because they got in my way, because they didn't do what I wanted them to do, because they don't think like I think. What is 
what is driving me. One more thing. When I'm doing something good, when I'm doing a good deed, okay, a godly, a godly thing, it is a really, really good idea as I'm doing this good thing to ask, what is driving me? Because it is so easy to do the right thing for the wrong reason. And if I do the right thing for the wrong reason, it may help somebody else, but it does not help me. Jesus, uh, in his most famous message, his most famous sermon, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7, through he spent a big chunk of that sermon basically saying, when you are nice to a stranger, you are kind to somebody, don't put it on Facebook. When you have decided to, to give more to your church, to help the, church, the, the, the work of the church, don't tell your small group. You know, when you have, you have you know, decided that, that you are going to, to change the direction of your life and you're going to serve the underserved in your community, stay away from Twitter. He said it just like that. Not exactly like that, but you know, a little, little bent sort of that, that kind of thing. When you fast... When you fast because you want God to have control of your life and, you, and not, not your, simply your desires to be in control of everything. Don't say that to other people. What is it? When you do something good, what is it that just sort of drives you to share it? To encourage someone else with what they you know. If they know this good thing that I'm doing, maybe they'll be emboldened to do it. Maybe, you know, what is it in me that makes me want others to think? What's driving me? Is it really a love for God? Or is it about me? It's about my selfish, temporary desires that are a vapor. Now, I... I know a lot of us, when we think about, you know, I don't want to do the right thing for the wrong reason. So if I don't have a right motive, I'll just stop doing good things. You know, if I don't have the right motive, I'll just, okay, don't use that as an excuse to just stop doing good things. Well, you know, if I helped them with that, I would really just be doing it because I feel guilty, so I'm not going to do it. Rather than do that, say, <clears throat> my motive needs to change. I, I want to do good, and I want to enjoy doing good because God has loved me and I love him back, and I love people. You know, when your motive is right, you enjoy doing good. When your motive is wrong, you kind of grit your teeth and bear it. Man, a love for God and a love for people makes living so much more fun, so much more enjoyable, because your motive is the way it was intended to be. Motive is everything. So, what's driving me? Is love driving me? If not, if love is not driving me, then let me see where I'm at. Let me, let me recognize where I'm at. Last week we saw this very disturbing proverb. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. It is so very possible, so very easy for you to be convinced of your rightness and it be leading to death. But there is a way that really is right and it leads to life. And it is a life of being motivated by love for God and a love for people. Let's pray. Dear God, this morning... Uh, God, I recognize that so, so many of us, maybe that have, like me, who've been in church for, for many, many years, and we have heard all our life, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, and it, it seemed almost meaningless to us. That it, doesn't, it doesn't sink in. We don't realize how much you love us and how much that matters. God, strip away from us our silly temporary self-centered motives our little desires for pleasure and desires for significance desires for escape 
and let us land in your love. Let us allow you to show your love to us. And God, help us to love you back. Help us just to love you back. And God, out of that love, teach us how to love people. Teach us not just how to tolerate people, not how to ignore people, not how to coexist with people. Teach us how to actually, truly care about people, to love them because of the love that you have for us and because of the love that you have for them. God, may our love drive us, we pray in Jesus' name.